All right, all right. So Vic, Vic covered it. I'm a pen tester. He's an elevator guy. We met because this industry needs a little kick in the pants as far as security is concerned. And even though he is not here representing Paint Elevator, we are here representing the hacker community and a bunch of interesting ingenuity and fun things that you all can do. Speaking of fun things that you can and can't do, what should they try to do or not do? Pretty much you shouldn't do anything. But uh, our lawyers have required to mention that, of course, standard disclaimers apply. You're responsible for your own behavior. And we're telling you straight up most of these things are either prohibited by law or would put you at a great degree of risk of physical harm. Or uh, you could damage equipment, which would be financial harm. So carefully consider your actions before taking anything away from this talk. Yeah, elevators in general are not going to kill you. Most elevator trips go without incident. Most people every year, the few that are actually injured or killed are basically people like him working on elevators. But yeah, you all, like that, I mean, Howard said it, but really pay attention. It's fun to F around with stuff, right? But you say there, there are various failure modes. Yes. Elevators can behave in ways that you don't necessarily expect. And as a result, things like this can happen. So here we have a leg in a gap between the car and a landing sill. That's about one inch wide. Yes. Yeah. Now, y'all might think you're, you're smart enough. You might say, look, we're not, we're not complete idiots. We're not going to die. We just want to play, right? Because that's very hackerish. Doesn't mean that you can't cause major damage if you don't know what you're doing. So just because you think you're smart enough not to kill yourself, it doesn't mean you're not facing like a felony criminal mischief causing excess thousands of dollars. So like we've all seen this on YouTube, right? It never gets old, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. Have you guys seen this one? <laughs> Charge right there. So whenever state this happened in, it was like over a thousand dollars worth of damage. So it became a felony for this guy. So yeah. So we're experts at this. You're not. Please believe us when we say you shouldn't try most of this stuff. Many of you may have seen this talk before or some version of this talk. We keep updating it and revising it. How many people have seen the beginnings of the elevator hacking talk, like at Hope or DEF CON? So a lot of you know some of the basics. We're not going to get into every little different kind of elevator system ever. Understand that at least there are two major varieties of elevator. There's overhead traction and there's hydraulic, which is usually pushing from below. But in each of those cases, the elevator itself, the, the box that you're standing in, the room, that little traveling room, does not contain most like motor drive power. The power source of motion is either way up in the penthouse or way down below in the pit. And the car you're in, mechanically, virtually all it has are things like rollers on the sides that just guide it along the rails in the hoistway that stabilize its travel. But the actual power source is somewhere else and you are just interacting with that system through a series of fixtures and panel technology. Right. So there's a variety of fixtures that you're going to interact with. Most of the time, it just comes down to pushing buttons. And it's going to give you feedback in the form of illuminated indicators like you're seeing here. So all of those fixtures are tied back to some type of components in the machine room. So somewhere, whether it's a hydraulic elevator in the machine room in the basement, or whether it's a traction elevator and it's in the penthouse, Everything's going back to this motor room, and the controller, which you're going to see in a second, is making the decision to drive those motors. This is a very boring looking motor room. This is a hydraulic elevator. Not a whole heck of a lot going on. What you're seeing on the right is the controller, and that's actually driving what that hydraulic pump unit that's in the middle, and then you can see the hydraulic line actually running up and around and back into the hoistway. And you also can see some buckets of oil, which uh, we'll get into some we of this stuff later. That many there, yeah. But everything you do to interact with this elevator from any of the fixtures, hallway, cab, et cetera, you're talking to this. Howard, this is the controller, right? Correct. Now, the controller unit, I mean, it's very much you know, like in hackers. It's, what's the kernel, man? It's the brain. Like, this is, this, is the, this is the brains of the operation. It is in the motor room, and it is doing all the decision logic. The evolution of this comes primarily from relay logic controllers. So we've been talking about a lot of different types of elevators, but Fundamentally, the decision-making machine that is the controller was traditionally just a series of relays that were interconnected that would pull in or drop out depending on the state that the elevator existed in. Yeah. Where it is positionally, who wants what demand, etc. And some of these are still in use, the old there's, relays. There's a lot of them still like, in use. Like, look at this. This is not in a museum somewhere. This is in New York City. 
and it's operating, as you can see. So this is actually a type of Otis controller called the UAL. And you see that as relays are dropping in and picking out, other relays are dropping in and picking out. And there's a little bit of lag, because you know, it's old analog and all that fun stuff. What you're seeing here is the pie plate selector. It spins around as the elevator is moving up and down the hoistway and either makes or breaks contacts so that the elevator knows where it's located. So if you're going to four, when the contact for four comes in, that's how the elevator knew that it was there, because something was making a physical contact, completing a circuit, and that was that. And again, some of these systems, because it's expensive to totally tear out and put in a new elevator, some of these systems are still running to this day. This was this, still running. Look at this. <laughs> like, we're not trying to scare you. Elevators are very safe. Remember those first few slides? They're safe because there's not a lot that can go wrong with logic this basic, right? How many viruses existed in, like, <laughs> OS2, right? Uh, well, well uh, this actually was from an accident site, so... <laughs> The controller was not involved, though. It was, it was something else. Uh, yeah. But modern, so you saw the, the smaller panel that we opened up, the modern controller systems. They're all microcontroller. But they're all doing the same job. They're or, all taking user input, taking data input from where the, the elevator is positionally, and adding that up and saying, what do I need to drive this motor to do? Yeah, you'll see PLCs, too, but they're a lot less common. So what other kind of inputs are in like the hoistway? The most simple way, besides the pie plate selector, because that's obviously a little more mechanically complex, the most simple way for an elevator to know where it was was to have roller switches like this that when the elevator arrived, a little vane would push a, a, you know, a spring-loaded switch and actually make or break a contact that was wired in the hoistway. What you're seeing here is not that, though. This is something called a limit switch that still exists on modern elevators. This is at the very top of the hoistway. There's also limit switches at the bottom of the hoistway. That's to indicate to the elevator it's approaching or is at the end of its actual possible travel run. And if you hit that last switch right at the top there, that's the I'm fucked signal. And that means that you absolutely need an elevator guy to come out and fix it. That cab will not move. So, so yeah, it's slow down limit one, slow down one, slow down two. There's two slow downs. Yeah. The third one's a normal, normal limit. limit. That will be pushed in when that elevator is level with the top floor. And then the final <laughs> limit, which means there's nowhere else for that cab to go. Yeah. But beyond that, beyond the top and the bottom, you have this in the middle of the hoistway, running through the hoistway, like a magnetic tape system, right? Right. This one uses uh, magnetic, well, uh, magnetic strips that are placed on that tape, the black tape that runs up and down in the picture next to the guide rails. That is a selector. The selector is picking up that magnetic input with a little reed switch. And as it's going down, it can tell, again, where it's located. The advantage to this, of course, is that since it's not an actual physical system that's moving back and forth, this is a lot less prone to fail. Right, because a mechanical switch will break after you know 100,000 uh, you know repetitions, whatever. So these are a lot less likely to fail in that mode, but they can fail in other ways, which we'll yeah. talk about. And the elevator cab should know, and the controller should know where the cab is traveling at any given time. Not just am I at a floor, but even in between floors, right. how fast am I going? What's the travel like? The elevator should know what it's doing at all times, and that's how it can tell whether to stop the motor, slow the motor down whether to re-level if you're you know, in a really crappy hydro that's... Have you ever been in an elevator that kind of like stopped, and then you felt like a little tiny extra lurch, like a, a re-level? Yeah, right. because it was drifting off the floor level. Or if the load changes, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you start loading 20 people in an elevator because you didn't want to wait for the next one, and it kind of like does that number, re-level. Yeah, the selector found is like, whoa, something's moving here. What if something moves really, really wrong, right? Elevators have safeties. Elevators for the longest time have had very interesting mechanisms that have prevented you from dying. Many people may know, if you're a history buff, the name, especially in this country, but a big name in elevators is what's, what's the the like, name you think of, Mr. Who? Otis. Otis. Otis did not invent the elevator, right? Otis did what to the elevator? He made it safe. He made brakes. He made mechanisms. He didn't make, he didn't make brakes. Right. He made a specific type of brake. He made a break. specific type of brake, yeah. right. He made a safe mechanism that would literally survive severing of the roping system. So here we see modern governors, and we see other safeties that'll, that'll work in up direction travel, that'll prevent overspeed. But the like, original Otis rail gripper safety was designed so that if there's positive pressure, if there's tension on the roping cable, the hoist cable, the safety's doing nothing. It's just kind of tucked in. But if that cable goes slack, for example, if the entire rope system breaks, or the winch fails, or who knows what, that mechanism under spring pressure will fire out and grip the rails. And this is a gentleman, actually clearly very much on British television, and I'm not saying that just because of his teeth, 
but because he's being raised way higher than you would let someone do a TV host in America. And just having a workman come on up and slice the line. And he's like, is this going to work, right? And then sure enough, ka-chunk. And that's historically what Mr. Otis would do at these trade fairs and world fairs. He would hoist himself up, cut the rope, and everyone would scream. And then he'd, be, he'd say, it's all safe, everyone. It's this, I mean, Skylar knows history of engineering stuff like yeah. this, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is what has evolved into modern elevator braking systems and rope gripper systems and rail grippers. The idea of a governor roping setup, a series, when we say ropes in the industry, you know, we're not talking like hemp systems. They used to be. <laughs> yeah, it used to be. That's, like, what, that's what this yeah, you know, was all the, the modern cables, or as we say, ropes, there's extra roping going on in the hoistway, traveling with the car, and if for any reason, <coughs> the car overspeeds, the governors, the extra, the governors will, will trip and yank on that rope, jamming into the brake mechanisms, which will just snug shoes into the rail, grab it. Rip the rail and yeah. bring the car to a stop. Exactly. So it's actually really hard to die in an elevator if you're not using it like a jack wagon. Like if you're just in the cab, the safest place to be is in the cab because the cab is not going to plummet and free fall. And even if something completely went wrong and like, you know, literally like, the governor rope sheared, the governor, nothing grabs, you're just going down. There are buffers in the pit. The pit is designed to, to accept the full weight of the elevator at full normal travel speed, right? Correct. And just crash into that buffer and survive, not even damage the elevator. You might get a little damaged, you might twist an ankle, but the elevator is going to try to keep you alive. And these systems have evolved over the years in a lot of ways to make you be safe every day. Elevators want you to live, and we want you to live. With that said, another disclaimer. Yeah. One other disclaimer. That's, they want you to live if you're in the cab, right? Now, we're not, like, I'm dating a girl from MIT, and there's, like, a lot of history in the hacker culture with elevators and things you shouldn't do. But, like, you don't want to be these kids, right? You don't want to, seriously, we, we laugh at this bad TV. This, 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 is, footage, right? this, this, is, actual, this is actual surveillance footage. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh at this. Don't dick around with this shit. Like, Just like hackers yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that part's accurate. There's a light on top of the car. Yeah. Right? Well, most, most motor rooms have live music. So. so sure enough, you know, riding on an elevator top is fun. No! <laughs> You don't want that failure mode. <laughs> and that's like, we laugh, and that's happened. Yeah. People have been killed by the counterweight. It's, it's don't fuck around on the hoistway, people. We're telling you this for a reason. I mean, even if it's not getting hit by the counterweight, there's obviously fall hazards, there's electrocution hazards, there's a million hazards. So that's why we need to just yeah. remind you that we're not responsible for you being stupid. You'll yeah. see video of me being stupid later. <laughs> so I was stupid, so you don't have to be. So that being said, we said automatic mode, the elevator wants you to stay alive and will keep you alive. There are a lot of special modes of operation, though, and we would love to share some of them with you if you're interested. Are you interested? Yeah. yeah. All right. Bang right off the bat. How many people do pen test work? If you are a pen tester, like me and like many of us, you will probably play with independent service mode if you ever tinker with an elevator. There are key switches or even just flip switches behind locked panels. Independent service mode is far and away one of the most useful things you can do in an elevator. If you want it to do things, it's not supposed to do. Flipping to independent will take the elevator out of the group bank and it'll make it your private elevator. Now in many buildings, like an apartment and stuff, they'll use independent if they have to move somebody in and they don't want that elevator going away and being used for other demand. But if you're a pen tester, Everything including like go to the other floors I'm not supposed to go to, that will work. Don't open the doors, like that work. The elevator won't service hall calls. I've hidden in elevators for hours in a building, just sitting there waiting for everyone to go home because I snuck in, flipped to independent, waited forever, like I rolled a chair in there and just plugged my phone into the little GFCI outlet. And then at the end of the day, I like drive down to the lobby, let the team in, then I drive it up to the top floor that's restricted, let everyone out. Independent mode is super, super user time, really. Like, it's the good shit, man. Most of the time. It's, yeah. it, uh, uh, there are ways to configure elevators so that independent service won't override security. Mm -hmm. But 90% of the time, it's going to. Yeah. So, 
And that's kind of an outgrowth of an older style of service, right? Right. So back in the day, historically, there used to be an attendant that was actually doing the job of the controller. They didn't have relay logic at a certain point. It was just a single speed AC motor or a DC motor or whatever. And you know, they'd have a crank just like this, and they could go up or down at one speed. The innovation back then was we have two speeds now. All right. But what they would do is they would just you know, decide, OK, I have passengers waiting in the lobby. I'll be right back for you. They'd go drop off people and come back and you know, pick them up. So attendant mode is sort of an offshoot of that, that on an automatic controller, what you can actually do is have the car still picking up people in the direction of travel or dropping people off in the direction that you're traveling, or even skip stops. That's what the bypass button does. But at a certain point, the attendant can make a decision. I need to reverse direction. I need to go the other way for some reason. Yeah, that's this car's full. I can't take anyone else. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's a sort of semi-automatic attendant mode. The elevator's still making the leveling. It's still opening the doors. It's still doing the safety stuff. But the attendant is controlling the actual dispatching of the car. Now, what if you want to give people in your building the ability to be prioritized like an attendant would, but you don't want to pay for an attendant? They have that, too. They have like express and executive service, right? Right. So these are usually variants of the exact same thing, which is just that some demand gets priority over other demand. So in the case of an express or executive service, what that means is that it's either going to bring a car that's kind of in the same direction, you know, whatever's next, you know, it's going to stop anyway. It's going to stop there and it's going to pick somebody important up and service their demand before it services other demand. VIP. <laughs> Executive priority service is actually that it will reverse the direction of the closest car, regardless of what it was doing, and then tell everybody in the car, you know, get the hell out. The CEO's here. It's literally Basically. a voice announcement. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like, boo, this car is needed for other services. Please exit at the next landing. Uh, uh, yeah. this, um, this relates also to hospital emergency mode, something uh, you've probably also seen, code blue, people call it, which we're going to cover. These are very closely related. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Now, yes, question back there. I've seen in other countries, and one of the countries I was saying in the elevator, for off-road, I wonder if you do that here. That's an incredible So She said, uh, why not be able to automatically cancel if you push the wrong floor? Fujitech does this. Okay? You can cancel the call from the cab by pressing it a second time. The reason I think most controller manufacturers don't do that is because we're Americans, and we would trample each other to get to our destination a second faster. And therefore, people would get in the cab and just cancel each other's calls to get where they're going quicker. <laughs> That's my hypothesis. So. Yeah. so speaking of people who think they're more important than other people, <laughs> there's like Sabbath mode, if you think that like the most important, not that Sabbath, like that Sabbath mode, if you saw like Bill Maher's film. Yeah, people who think that because of words on high, they're not allowed to do certain things on religious days, Sabbath mode is a mode that lets you use an elevator without touching any buttons. And how does it do this? Well, the elevator will go to the top floor of a building and then platform at every floor on the way down, opening its doors, letting you like mosey on or off. On a really tall building, it might do every other floor. But the idea is it makes people think that they're not actually pressing any switches or tripping any, re you're, you're totally tripping all if, kind of relay logic when this happens. Like. If, if you're observant, I apologize for breaking the bad news. You've probably been lied to. Uh, there are several, several circuits involved that you're interrupting you know, the flow of current, and, and it might just be ignored. The inputs might be ignored by the controller. But when you break that beam on the scanner edge on the door, you're still breaking that beam, and it still sees you there, and you're still you know, creating fire. The load in the car, you get on. The elevator has to either work harder or work less because of you. And my understanding is that is very much prohibited by the same rules that have led to this. So this is, liter yeah. this is literally just bullshit. Now, what's interesting, though, is this is the first example we're going to give in this talk of like hacks that the industry folk have made. So this wasn't initially like programmed into the elevator logic. There are situations where people made their own special relays. And then on the weekends, they would have you know, some goyim come up there and be like, I can flip a switch, boom, and like turn on elevator service for like turn on sh Sabbath mode. And different logic would apply. And these sort of hacks in the industry eventually got programmed in when more and more like elevators went up in Yonkers and such, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You realize we just hit the Yes, we did. Shut it yes. down. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, this idea, though, of crafting your own, roll your own system, there's a lot of this in the industry. 
and you're going to see more examples of really smart things or really dumb things that people in the industry have done just to make something work a different way. And I find that fascinating. Something I really, really wish they would make work better than they do. There is something called load bypass. How many people have been in a crowded elevator and you're like, why is it stopping at all these floors trying to pick up calls when there's no room left in the elevator? I wish it would just go to the lobby. How many people have been? Yeah, all right, so same, hands, same hands. Same hands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, how many people have been in an elevator that beeps when it's too heavy? Because you put too many, yes. The elevator can sense how much weight is in it most of the time. So these systems are programmed to be able to say how much load is in this car and either alert or alarm. You can configure that in the logic to say, hmm, this elevator is at 90% of its load capacity. It's on floor 17 and trying to make its way down. I'm not going to keep collecting all of this down demand right now. I'm just going to go to the lobby. Why this isn't enabled more? <laughs> hire more people like him in your building, well, and they'll a, program the shit. It's always optional. I mean, that's not a standard feature on most elevators, but, um, but it's a useful feature. So. Yeah. What's that? License key. License key? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is there a dongle? <laughs> How about this? Is that patented? I don't, I don't believe so, because there are so many different methods of doing it. You know, there, there's just a lot of different products. So even if there was a patent on one particular product, it's been done. So, How many people have seen idiots in the elevator press all the buttons? Elevators can tell when somebody is fucking around with it. You're saying you pressed all the fuck you. <laughs> Elevators can tell no, sorry, that something is wrong. There's like, there's not enough going. of us in this cab. Awesome. There's not a lot of people. Boom, done. The scanner edge isn't breaking. That's amazing. Keep recording. Very good. But we keep hitting enough buttons, the elevator's like, come on, don't tell me another one. One, two, three, and boom, out. It's like they know we're here. <laughs> yeah. Bump, bump. And it only drops some of them. What is going on? So that's on? like, that's a light load in Sorry, the elevator. Sorry, guys, we're actually trying to get where you're going. Because like, you are two people. And eight's There's not no even reason you need to go to nine floors right now. Oh, wow. oh, this is All right, now, we didn't talk about. Now we're never going to get out of here. All right. <laughs> So we got so, a new one for you we didn't yeah. mention in Hope or DEF CON. Uh, a correction run is the mode the elevator will go into when its encoder and selector inputs start to differ. So when the motor's saying, I went you know, X number of feet, and the selector is saying, well, I didn't go that many feet, <laughs> the elevator might run itself in what's called a correction run. So instead of running at contract speed or high speed is what it's called, it'll run at inspection speed, which is usually like a tenth of the original speed or less and it'll go until it hits one of those limit switches we were talking about, then it'll reverse direction, and it'll go and hit the other limit switch. And the whole time, it's looking at the encoder inputs, and it's learning the hoist away again. It's saying, okay, I've got 10 floors, and this is how far apart they are. So when it gets lost, it might be a situation like this, where you might be very well in the cab when this happens. You might be like, what is going on with this <laughs> elevator? <laughs> It would not be unheard of. If you, if you are, and, and this happens, chances are the floor indicator will go out. You'll feel that you're going up. It'll eventually stop. You'll reverse direction. You'll feel that you're going down. It'll eventually stop, and it'll open its doors and let you out. So if that ever scared. happens, now yeah. you know. Yeah. Don't be scared. That's, no nothing, that's the nothing, being Nothing safe. unsafe. Yes? What are the consequences of getting out of sync? The consequences of it, getting out of sync? It can create faults in the controller. The car can shut itself down. It can entrap passengers. But for the most part, it's not really a safety issue so much as it is and you know, a passenger discomfort issue if someone was in, in traps, mm -hmm. you know, or if someone had a medical problem while they're in trap, that's a yeah. problem too. You don't want to miss level, you don't want to like keep, you, the worst case could possibly be in, like driving beyond. Right. Because the selector says, hey, I'm getting close, and the motor's like, mm, I haven't turned that far. You don't, well, don't want to be out of sync for that reason. Yes? Do people in the car cause skew in the uh, optical encoder? The optical encoder? The weight, the weight on the actual elevator may cause skew as far as it's aligned. Oh, uh, if it's like out of true? Uh, it shouldn't, uh, because the different, well, whatever, you know, Again, whatever difference it would be it should be, you know, insignificant. The, the okay. tape itself is going to be fixed. It's not part of the actual hoisting system. Okay, I thought so, maybe there was an optimal encoder on the actual motor wheel at the top. There, there's, uh. there sometimes is. Yeah, like the actual traction shift will have a motor encoder. Okay. But as far as changing, you know, like yeah, the rope stretches a little bit. You're saying when there's a load, and that's true and all. But we're talking about when they're way out of sync. It's going to okay. fall out and it's going to try to relearn itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. Oh yeah, they said, do they have the ability to be overloaded? That was the nylode box up here. So yeah, there are various ways. That's just one. There's others that just measure the rope tension. Yeah, basically, yeah. a lot of times what it is is just that when the rope comes down, attaches to the car's crosshead, it's actually, you know, the rope is, is straight up and down. You can picture that. And there will be, uh, you know, 
something coming in like that, right? Two from one side and one in the middle. And then as the rope stretches, it's going to change that, you know, whatever distance it is very slightly. And so that's, that's the most common method that they use. Yeah, it's usually either a voice announcer or an indicator that'll say it's overload. Mm -hmm. Right, load, load bypass is when it's like, oh, I'm 75% full, I can get the hell out of here. But th you're, you're also asking about when it's overloaded. Yeah, they can detect that as well. So another mode that we haven't talked about before now that I just think is adorable, in Japan, someone mentioned Fujitech and the buttons, Japan has pet mode. And when we were trying to figure this out online, we saw an elevator panel with this button that you know, says pets. And we're like, what is this? And Pinguino is like, I think that should be awesome if dogs can run the elevator. Uh, it turns out that's not it. What it is, is if you're a guest and you have your puppy with you, you press pet mode and lights go on in the hall stations so that if anyone is like scared of dogs, like, oh, such pets, so afraid, they like won't, <laughs> they won't get on the cab or something or they'll like run away. I don't know what happens in Japan. But you don't see that. I would support this in America just because I like to play with puppies, but oh well. So that's like an obscure one. Yes, I would get on the Everybody elevator with like bacon, yeah, either, give it to the dog. Either way though. Somebody tweeted this at us, right? Yeah, this is interesting. I, I, I honestly don't know where this is from. I'm guessing it's from a parking garage that kind of has that zigzaggy type of shape. But uh, it's not uncommon to see odd implementations like this. This is, this is a Dover, by the way. We're going to get into how... Dover Impulse, right? It is Dover Impulse fixtures. We're going to get into that in, in a little bit. But um, yes, these yeah, are... Yeah, the I just like that they made a badge for the floors that says, hey, like somebody at the factory yeah. has this badge. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Really? really? Because the floors are tiny for the children? Is that how they do it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. One other thing that ma many people wish elevators had is peak performance and peak optimization. During the morning, and especially around check-in time at a hotel, are people mostly trying to go, I'm sorry, during the morning you're trying to check out, right? So you're trying to go which way, up to your room or down to the lobby? What about at 2 and 3 in the afternoon when you can finally check into a hotel? Where are you trying to go? Everyone wants to go up. The elevators can be configured for peak performance, where they park and where they idle, waiting for the next call. Maybe in the morning, a lot of the cabs park themselves on the top floor because they expect people to be coming down. All of this can be optimized if you have a competent tech programming the controller, and it can get people around the building faster. If you have a building, please, if your building owners are in this room, if you have a building that you, like, everyone bitches about the elevator, hire someone who knows what they're doing. You can make it a lot freaking better. Take me two seconds to punch it in a sim tower and we can figure it all out. <laughs> so, but yeah, we're going to try to pick it up here a little bit, I think, mm -hmm. but sim tower was originally an elevator simulator, like an actual technical simulator. It was meant to be a performance model. And then Maxis got their hands on it and said, you know, we should add some disasters. That's pretty popular. <laughs> Speaking of disasters, there is seismic mode or earthquake mode that, that, is exi that exists in certain elevators. They will trip if the elevator gets in trouble, if they actually feel the building shaking. And what he taught me is sometimes an elevator in seismic alert will go up and not down. Why would that be? When the building starts shaking, there's the risk that the counterweight or the cab can actually become free from the rails if the shaking is sufficiently hard. And if the counterweight becomes free and the motor starts driving you towards this swinging counterweight, well, it's just a wrecking ball. It's just a 4,500 pound, you know, whatever, wreck, you know, however many ball just swinging around, and if it crashes into the car, you've got a pretty serious problem. So it is possible if you're ever in a situation where you're, you're in an elevator during an earthquake, it could very well take you up, which is totally counterintuitive, but just get the hell off. Yeah. Other times, elevators might go up. It's, it's not seismic unrest, but you like to say civil, civil unrest. Civil unrest. Right. Yeah. So riot mode basically just takes ground connected levels out of the play. So you know, if somebody's you know, ransacking the building and they throw a brick through the glass and they're able to access the lobby, they're not going to be able to call the elevator. But the building's occupants can still use the elevator to move around internally. So yeah. the one place that I actually saw this was at a museum. So for whatever reason, they wanted to be able to move around and they didn't want, you know, if somebody happened to get through, they wanted to make sure that area was not accessible, but the other ones were still usable internally. It's a pretty neat, like the, these are all things that didn't exist long ago, but some customers said, hmm, I want, can we do this? And people in the industry were like, I guess we could. Let's program that shit in. Just like Code Blue, hospital priority service. 
The idea of a doctor who's got a patient that has to go somewhere right away, oh my God, flip that key. It's like super absolute priority. Not even ex like executive and VIP mode. I think it'll, plat it'll level and then come back. This will literally take the nearest car, immediately switch its direction, and run at rated speed right back to the floor while making that announcement that says, elevator needed, please get out immediately. And then I think it even sits there with the doors open until the person with the key right. takes it and drives it. Yeah. It gives you a super user type mode because you need that elevator to get a patient somewhere. One of the main distinctions between that and executive service like we were talking about is the automatic versus manual door control. In code blue, door controls manual. In executive mode, well, you don't need to have executives waste their time pushing buttons, right? So. Yeah. So also in hospitals, code blue, there's also code pink. Code pink is baby theft mode. If you're not familiar with security in hospitals, Elevators can do what's called a type of security recall, where if somebody moves a child and they're not authorized to move that baby, doors will lock around the hospital and a pager goes off. But even elevators, you'll get stuck in an elevator. Or they'll take you to the security like, level and sit there and cycle the doors or keep the doors shut like a man trap. So elevators have been leveraged into a lot of interesting security architectures in many, many ways. And over the years, people have come to depend on them because we've gotten rid of a lot of security staff. Because we said, well, no, I mean, the elevator will handle that. Nobody could do that. Nobody could get to that floor. But a lot of this gets undermined with the one feature that is super universal in almost every elevator. Fire, fire mode. operation. Yes, fire service mode. Since 1973 elevator, well, since the 1973 code, elevators have been required to have some form of firefighters emergency operation. Back in 73, it was just recall. That's when the smoke detectors or the heat detectors went off somewhere near the elevator. It would take the elevator out of service and bring it down to the lobby so that occupants could not use it. This came out of the fact that the buttons used to melt when the floor was on fire, contacts would get shorted, and the elevator would stop at a floor that was on fire with people inside it. So if you ever saw the towering inferno, yeah, That's it's real. funny, yeah. but it happened several times. It happened in Chicago not that long ago on an elevator that wasn't even retrofit. So then what they started doing after recall, they said, well, what if we need to use the elevator during a fire? And then they added what was called phase two. That's the actual true firefighter's emergency operation. That's when the firefighter comes into the building, gets the key, turns it at the lobby, gets in the car, turns the key in the car, and then rides it wherever the fire is. Usually not to where the fire is. Usually it's two floors below where the fire is. But, you know, you know depending on yeah. department policies, whatever. But, um, but yeah. Most important part of firefighters' operation you need to know as far as security concerns is that all your security concerns go out the window during an emergency. It's in the code. It actually says that firefighters' emergency operation must override any lockouts that you've put on on a floor. So, mm -hmm. sorry, if you put you know, investments into your elevator security, that completely fucks it up. What if the firefighter's Jewish? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not repeating that. <laughs> yes, come on. Then it has to stop at every floor. Do they have one key that fits all elevators? Uh -huh. The question is, do they have one key? Uh, you, we'll get to that. There's a whole section on that. Yeah. In, in a specific building, a building may only use one key, no matter how many elevators they have. Yeah, I was going to say, only in the Yeah. Any given building will have one key. Some states have adopted their own key that's universal throughout the state. One state, at least, forced a super old key to be retrofitted everywhere. We got a whole section on the keys about elevators and shit. But, oh, yeah. There's a lot of interesting things relating to elevators and fires. So, I mean, I found this little key switch up in the Montana State House, and I'm like, what? It's not really, it's like a toggle switch. What the heck is this thing? It, it looks like it's related to the fire. Should I touch it? Probably not. And I'm glad I didn't, because this is the smoke guard system. In, in an elevator system, like a hoistway is basically a giant chimney, and smoke and fire condition can spread throughout a building very rapidly. But smoke guard and systems like it will, cut, will drop a shield in front of the hoistway doors to prevent smoke and hot air from traveling around a building when you don't want it to in a disaster. This is a little unusual, too, because most modern elevators that are concerned with this will just have louvers and a damper at the top of the hoistway. So it'll either open or close, depending on you know, whatever the fire suppression system decides is right. So this is, a, this is I hadn't actually heard of this until David showed it to me. But you have situations where, like, ask us during the Q&A or ask us in the bar later. There might be situations where you've seen, these are two different elevators in the same building. This is a regular passenger elevator and a service elevator. Now, one of them happens to have all your traditional fire keys, including this red halo around the fire service switch. This one over here does not appear to have that, right? But if you look off to the side, it was a retrofit. It was a secondary mod. So you'll see as code changes, and Howard can walk into elevators and be like, oh, well, this switch is here. That's there. 
Look at this, they're running on the 83 code. Are they, they've, got the 90, they've adopted the 96 code in this building. So there's a lot of differences in code based on what you're going to see and how the elevator might behave, but they're all supposed to be following these rules, which is why we were really surprised when we saw an elevator really close to where we are, right? This is, yeah, this is, I, it's so weird. It's identical to the ones that are here. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this is, okay, let's just tell. This yeah. is the pool elevator, okay? And for some reason, they don't actually have a fire service key switch, right? What it kind of came down to is that it must have been built like to like 80, pretty much 83 code, which is what I said to him when I saw this, uh, that they basically implemented it so that there's only one elevator in the bank, okay? If there's a fire, it's going to go on emergency recall. So that's the jewel, the fire service jewel. It's going to light up. It's going to say, hey, the building's on fire. I'm going back to the lobby. Call cancel is used on phase two, but how do you get to phase two? There's the key switch in the lobby. So unlike a modern elevator where they have to turn two key switches when they get here, for some reason they just set it up so that, well, you turn the key in the lobby, the car is probably going to go straight to phase two. But, you know, yeah. please don't it's, try that here. Yeah, we, it's elevator obscura. There's some real obscure shit in this industry, man. By the way, who could possibly have more control over an elevator than a fire responder? Who is more important to an elevator than a fire personnel? Elevator personnel, right, exactly. The most powerful mode in pretty much any system is hoistway inspection mode. Is getting, if you are in the hoistway, you are God at that point. Inspection overrides fire service, but there's a pretty sensible reason for that when you think about it. If there's a guy on the car top and you start moving the car unexpectedly and he's working on something, you could create a serious problem. Not just, you know, for the it's fact that. Video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so basically, and the other, uh, the other thing is, too, if, if I was on a car top and there's a little indicator that'll actually say, hey, the car wants to be on fire service, but it's not, I'm getting the hell out of there. I'll be the first one out of that building. So, yeah. so it just in general, though, the hoistway is a not safe place to be if you do not know what you're doing. There are a lot of controls in the hoistway that you don't know what they do exactly if you haven't been trained. There's a lot of circuitry and equipment on car tops that you can be interfering with if you step on the wrong thing or trip over something. There's a lot of shit going on in there. You don't need to be on the car top unless you've been trained to be on a car top. There are even roping configurations where there's moving rope shivs on top of the cars. If it's rope two to one, you're actually gonna have a traction shiv with the ropes moving and the traction shiv moving on top of the car. Very little place to stand, very little place to put equipment or any tools or anything like that. Super duper dangerous. So, you know, yeah. for whatever it's worth, I mean, you know, you, you have to know what you're getting into here. So. And it's sometimes hard to know what you're getting into because if you're not in the industry, Things in the industry won't make sense to you. Take it away on how this works. Well, you know, it's not that complicated, right? If you want to shut down the elevator, you do what anyone would think you'd do. You turn the key to on. <laughs> yeah. Because you have to turn, turn shutdown shut mode, mode on. on. Yeah. And shutdown is no, shutdown to shutdown yeah. to be running. Sometimes you'll actually see the shutdown switch will be labeled MG. So if you ever see that, it's motor generator. You're on a DC powered car. But you know, the, the hoist motor is using DC and there's an actual you know, phase converting motor generator set that's converting the AC into DC. So if you're turning the MG off, you're effectively turning the elevator off. So just because you think you've read something on the internet, you might not be an expert, right? We all know how to internet really hard in this building, but don't jump around on the car top, don't screw around on the hoistway if you haven't learned it from an actual expert. That said, would you like to see a whole lot of stuff very quickly about elevator security and how it can be subverted? Yay. Okay. We have a lot of, we do have a lot of material. We were a little late because y'all were trickling in a little slow. We're going to go as fast as we can and we're going to get through as much as we can and, and maybe slide. And we'll give you a bingo notch if we slide a few minutes late into, into Hacker Trivia. So, disabling the hall call buttons. Huh. Right. Apparently everybody thinks this is a great idea. Uh, it's, it's really popular at schools, like high schools, middle schools, where kids are, you know, old enough to know they can kind of cause trouble pushing the buttons and they would just do it to create a nuisance. So a lot of times you'll see something like this. Uh, in the case of the one that's actually on the left, it's a situation where you have to actually have the key to register the call. In the one that's on the right, you can just toggle it. Do I want to allow people to be able to register calls or not? Or maybe there's no all call buttons at all. Right. Maybe you just need a key to, to go up or down and register a call that way, right? Right. How many of you have been in a situation where the actual button isn't a button, but you need to register, you can latch a call with a credential of some kind, like you know, a room key, for example? Have you seen that? Yep. Maybe like here on floor six? Exactly. So these are all ways of trying to restrict travel around a building. Being able to say certain buttons are just locked out with these cutout key switches, right? Right. 
And the reason you can't actually just have a key switch in the cab, again, is for firefighters' operation. If the firefighter had no button to push, they're not getting to that floor, and that can create a situation. So the code requires that there be a button, and you can have a lockout, but they can't interact with each other in such a way that it would override firefighters' operation. So all of these systems, all these credentials that say, oh, you need a badge, and you can't go at this hour of the day, all of these systems are able to be subverted in one way or another. And we like to joke that the only real secure solution to this kind of stuff is like physically securing the elevator. And by that, I mean, this, you see this big lock next to the buttons. Howard will tell you, that's not, it wasn't locking the button, right? <laughs> this is real shit. Yeah. This is from a detention facility, and this is how they secured their elevator. Um, this actually was a variance that was granted to them. This is not permitted by code, but they received a variance from the local you know, building department, given the circumstances. They said, okay, we understand you have special security considerations. Go ahead and put that there. That, of course, is from an accident site. So <laughs> I'll let you use your imagination as to what happened, but you know, if you're curious, hit us up at the bar. So. But in general, if you don't have a cage around your elevator, think of your elevator like an open stairwell. What would you do with a big open stairwell in an office building to be secure? You would vestibule it off, right? right? Elevators should be in a little vestibule situation on secure floors. Otherwise, in my opinion, they are not really that secure. Would you like to see us take a big dump over most of the security we just showed you? Yeah. All right. So remember those like, oh, I can't register a floor call because I need a key. I can't get the elevator. Well, here's something. Envelope packs. <laughs> So what, what happened there? <laughs> like, they, uh, they, they tripped the scanner edge, edge. Yes. yeah. The elevator happened to be platformed at that floor, so they just slipped something through the doors and tripped the scanner edge. Right. Not a universal trick. A lot of times that input is disabled once the doors have reached a fully closed position. I've always wondered what type of controller that was that worked on, but you know, hey, it's always interesting to know that it worked somewhere. So, <laughs> How about you're in a building where you can't get to, like, let's say, the top floor if you don't have the right credential? Again. Uncanny resemblance. Yeah, this was a Hilton property in um, Pennsylvania, I think, right? Yeah. So what if you want to get up there and you don't have a key, right? Here's what you do, and this, this is something, you can take this one home. You can try this yourselves. You it are, does not break anything. You're not going to kill yourself, and that's why I'm really happy to share this one with you. The answer is keep registering up calls to get as high as you can, and from the top floor, keep registering up calls to bring elevators up. If there's no one in that elevator, send it down manually, because then the next up call you register is going to call a different elevator and a different elevator. And eventually, you should be able to catch an elevator with some credentialed person who's just going up. It's going to stop Man. for you. And you're just, just getting unlucky, tailgating right? in, right? Right. So elevator dispatching, you know, a modern elevator uses what's called collective selective dispatching. That means it's going to collect all the calls <laughs> and selective as in like the select. I don't know what that was. <laughs> so collective selective, it's going to keep going in the direction it's traveling until it has a reason to reverse direction. So, it's important. so in this case, yep, we're going up. He was going up. Thank you. He's like, you guys going up? Yes, we are, Mr. Hotel Stand. Always have your doors. Can you guys hear Howard over the mic pretty well or no? All right. I mean, it's not like we're dropping major O'Day on this one right here, but... No, but this is a great, like, you know, just What's basic, uh, tool-less, yeah. skill type of, you know, escalation of privilege here, right? So the idea of, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm on the top floor. That took no equipment. That took no credentials. That took, you know, there's like the super lounge. There's everything else. Now, many buildings, as you know from being pen testers, if you check other doors in a facility, like, I'm not saying the elevator is the only way to do this. You might have a door like maybe something like this out here, and you say, okay. So you can have a cigarette up here on the third floor, the, on the top floor, the sixth floor. Sure. But I'm actually, I'm going to go ahead and go back inside. See you later. <laughs> See ya. That was totally in uh, South Nebraska. Yeah. But what do you need if you want to trigger, you know, actual other operation of these special features? Far and away, you're talking key switches. Key switches. Key switches trigger everything. And knowing how to find which key for which switch, like you can see, this industry had a little graffiti. You know, Elevator guys love their graffiti. So which switch is which? Most elevator folk don't track this kind of stuff. They just say, oh, I know I need these keys for these, you know, this elevator, this building. If you show up for an inspection, you just ask for them at the desk, or you get them in the box if you're a first responder. This man is a little bit more touched in the head. And he has been collecting a database of these keys throughout his entire career. This man has a collection of keys that are very impressive at this point. 
and he knows what every last fucking one of these do. But I, <laughs> like, it got so big, I had to stop using this plastic thing. It just goes in a box now. So every last one of these is a manufacturer-specific key, meaning it comes from the factory that way. Every one of these brands of fixtures, and there are elevator brands and fixture brands, right? Because right. There's, there's aftermarket parts. Yeah, and craft elevators for small shops. They'll just buy you know, non-proprietary fixtures, put an elevator together. But Howard can walk into an elevator and spot just by looking. I'll, I'll text him on jobs. I'm like, oh my god, dude, I'm in this, what, what key do I need? He's like, you know this, come on, recognize the buttons. What font is that? I'm like, oh my god, security is coming around the corner, what is this? He's I like, it's EPCO, it's always EPCO. <laughs> like, it's Helvetica, man. Yeah, so understanding that having the right set of keys will get you in a lot of situations. <laughs> but, now, for, but for the most yeah. part, not the crap that you, that you can actually buy online. Because for some reason, uh, vendors that specialize in either security stuff or fire products or, 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 frankly, just elevator products as well, have made their own key sets. There's no consistency. A lot of times they're inaccurate. A lot of times they're cut wrong. Or in the case of this one, which, by the way, really awesome of them to take pictures straight on facing those keys, right? <laughs> yeah. So not only did they do us that great favor, but they also put together the perfect set if your fire truck rolls through all seven of those states simultaneously <laughs> because there's no fucking pattern here. They just decided, hey, this is a key for somewhere, so put it on there and sell it. Yeah, the kind of sets you can usually buy online, they are, this is an industry with a lot of misinformation going on. You can search for these keys, you can try to buy an elevator key, you will often not know exactly what you're getting unless you're in the industry itself. Now, the industry itself, we people like to say, well, man, I've heard this industry is really modernizing. Like, what about those cutting edge systems, those, those destination dispatch? Like, I've seen those in new hotels. What do first responders need? Buttons to every floor. They are in the cab somewhere. They're hidden behind a panel, but they're still there. Fire service is still there. Emergency operation is still there. Forget about being elite in the future. This is an industry that is way still in the past. The industry has tried to modernize and done it really badly. This is remote monitoring through like LiftNet is a very popular package. Anybody recognize that title bar? Yeah. What, what operating system is this running on? Sure yeah. is. These are all supposed to be remote management controls. These are screenshots of the actual app. This is screenshotting from the actual user manual that's publicly available online from LiftNet. This is the super, uh, this is like the login password. Now, there is, don't worry, that's okay, they, they have a super admin The admin mode, right? password is different. That's, that's also in the same manual online. <laughs> MCE, elevator controls, like they have, a, they have a separate, you know, remote admin tool. This is their user manual. They're like, make sure you open up, you know, a special account to just make sure it's set to MCE support. You know what, go ahead and change your router password to MCE support. Like, just make everything yeah. MCE support. <laughs> In case we need to get in, I, so that you know we can get to this box remotely. I have to just say, honestly, MCE makes great elevator products, but they don't necessarily have the most secure elevator products. So with that being said, if you, you know, if I came to a job, I saw an MCE controller, I'm not thinking, oh, this is a shitty job. But then I see that, you know, and I start to wonder about what's going on there, you know, the XP screen. But I did ask about it, and they did tell me, no, it's cool. We got extended support. <laughs> <laughs> But so imagine this being remote accessible on your, this might be on your network right now, for all you know, depending on what elevator systems you have. By the way, we, we beg uh, forgiveness and Mark, being, we need like another 15, 20 minutes tops. Is that okay? Are you guys okay with that? All right, we want to show you all the new stuff too. So the biggie, like the, you asked earlier, is there like a universal elevator key? There is. It was defined in code. What code did they actually ultimately come out? This is the 2007 this code. This is the 2007, yeah. They defined the FEOK1, which was going to be like the super granddaddy, beat all others, firefighter service mode key. So of course, when they published the code document, asked me put the direct bidding code in the document <laughs> for this key. Like that belongs there. Yeah. Like, look at that, that's, that's actually a thing, man. And it's been that way for a while. Well, it gets worse. So most code is not retroactive. So this would not apply if your elevator was built to a code prior to the 2007 code. But the state of Vermont said, no, fuck that. We're retroactively going to require people to install the FEOK1 switch. 
So if you're a building owner in Vermont, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you just bought some <laughs> shitty key switches. Yeah. Every elevator in Vermont, FEO gate one. But what do pen testers do? How do we leverage this stuff? Well, you should already make, so make enough sense. If we have the right keys on a job, we are just going to slide around a building in ways they didn't expect. There was a job that we had where the front desk was the guard, but there was an elevator in the back of house. Now, you weren't supposed to be able, without credentials, to take this elevator up. You could get, like, from the parking deck, you could get to it. But what did we do? Well, you'll see the video of us on the left. You'll see the video they actually pulled from the surveillance on the right, because they didn't believe it when we tried to explain this. We said, all right, well, your back door could be locked a little better. That's one thing. And then we were able to call this elevator. And again, we shouldn't be able to drive it upstairs, right? But we said, look on camera and see how fast we were able to do this. Phase one, phase two. Boom. That was all we needed to flip the elevator to fire service mode and drive it up to the next floor. And because of the culture of this building, once we popped out on the main level, everyone just assumed you must have come through you know, the, the lobby. So yeah, of course you belong up here, right? I mean, you have this little white badge that doesn't say anything at all on it, but sure enough, you're in the building now. And that's all it took. It, it took like two seconds at the switches to be able to change modes in this elevator and get in there. Getting back to the disclaimers, though, it's worth pointing out that elevator resulted. It, it, the elevator ultimately was very unhappy with how quickly we were throwing the key switches on and off, and it did fault out. And there was a, a reset procedure that was required. Yeah, that we had most, to crawl, that, control, that delete that probably elevator. Probably most people in this room would not have been capable of. Yeah. Yeah. So that idea of going in the back door, just going up the elevator, that was something that blew the mind of this building owner because they didn't think that would be possible. They're like, "No, you need credentials." We're like, "Dude, we have the key, son. Like, the key is the key." Speaking of keys, how many people saw this article in the New York Post about the guy selling the fire keys? Exactly. And I love that the Post said, it's OK. We checked with locksmiths who said, it's OK to print these photos because no one could ever make duplicates of these keys. And they were like chewing out this guy and making him out be worse than Hitler. He was just some retired locksmith selling these keys without really caring who he was selling them to. Well, he knew what he was doing, but he just didn't, you know. Yeah, yeah he didn't care. But let me just tell you, here's a much better resolution photo of that key, by the way. <laughs> You'll see why this is not a major security breach. This is the famous 2642 key. It's the New York City key for all fire code in New York. The bidding code is 26420. Like, it's not crazy that that's actually, you know, in fact, they don't use the first bidding cut. So it's really just that. So it's not like he was selling this amazing top secret key that no one knew what it was. It's the name of the key. And we even had friends of ours just carving it on an Abbas blank. Yes. How do they well, protect themselves from that? You know, it really comes down to it. If you're, if you're in a situation where there's a regional key required, you're going to have to convince your local code official that you need a variance. Good luck. Yeah, good luck fighting City Hall. Now, there, there, there is something, there is actually something in that section of the code that allows like a UL 1037 rated uh, anti-theft device to be used as a key box for certain situations. If, I, I'm trying to think of the language. I think it's like if it's impractical, technically impossible, or like something else, or like, you know, it's technically, financially impossible, like, you know, some combination of those words. And you can get a variance based on the code if you can justify it. Or you can just be close to your code official and say, hey, you know, we got a secure facility here. We got to be able to do something. Slide him a case I'll, of beer. I'll, 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 work with, I'll work with your fire department, but, you know, you can't, you can't do this to me, basically. You know, but that's an uphill battle. And that's, mm -hmm. that's unfortunately what the code has kind of shoved down people's throats now. So, yeah, if you're taking something away from it, we're not telling you to get on a car top so much as we are saying, can we, like, talk about how shitty this code is with regards to security? Because nobody's talking about it besides us. So, yeah. There's not just like a citywide key. This is a key that applies to four fucking states. <laughs> the 3502 key, which again is an unrestricted key blank. It's a Yale 2. And you could totally see the bidding codes just by looking at the goddamn thing. There's this one that applies to the entire state of Tennessee. You, this is a hilarious story when you tried to order it, right? Yeah. So I, obviously I wanted to copy this. And so you know, I found out you could buy you know, various pieces of equipment that come with keys and without keys. I ordered the Tennessee key box. And I, I got it. It came without a key. And I said, shit, that didn't work. So then I called up, and I was like, well, uh, uh, you know, can I get the, uh, the Gamewell key box? And they're like, yeah, sure. So they sent it to me, and it comes with keys. <laughs> and so I call them up, and I say, why didn't you send it to me with the Tennessee box? And they go, well, because that's got the Tennessee key. It's the same key. You just can't call. It's like you can't walk in a head shop and say, I need to buy this bowl. But you're like, I would like this glass pipe, sir. And they're like, of course, wink, wink. 
So you can buy all the Gamewell Christmas tree keys you want. You just can't buy the Tennessee key. <laughs> I know this is real. Like, we're not making this up. Indiana. Indiana uses a key box. It's a tubular key. You guys know how hard that is to pick. You were doing it in the village. But again, you can order the box. You just can't order the key. Right. But how many of you have ever worked with a tubular lock, right? How many of you have ever used a tubular pick? Right. Some of you were doing it today. They come with that little key gauge, and then if you get a tubular key cutter, you can just make your own, and there you go. We just cut our own Indiana key that opens up all the Indiana state key boxes. There's the Indiana key code right there. That's another whole statewide key. There's a number of states that have moved to Medico, like Kentucky. We got some fans of bourbon and Derby Con in this room, I imagine. Kentucky uses a Medico classic style cam lock, but you can order the box. You can't order the key, you can order the key box. And as anyone knows, if it ships open, which it does, so you can mount the thing on your wall, you can take apart the cam lock. If you take the cam off and pull a plug out, you can then just take it apart very carefully by decapping it in your room at like DEF CON. And you say, okay, let's dump all these little pins out of here. Let's get that and put it on a nice pinning tray with our Medico pinning measurements. There we are. There's our cam. Let's look in Instacode for the codes. All right, we wrote that down. Let's put it back together and put the top plate back on it and reinstall it and return it. We're like, this did not meet our box of full needs. Thank you. <laughs> you there's the Medico key for all the freaking state of Kentucky right there. That works. Florida. Florida loves Medico for everything. You can order the Florida key boxes and the Florida key switches. Florida Zone 4. Let's take that sucker apart. Oh, it's an M3. It's not like it's that much more complicated. You can still measure the cuts. There's just more biaxial nature to it. Let's take those apart. Oops, there's the Florida Zone 4. That's all of Tampa. Oh, and that's also Zone 6. That's Orlando. Oh, and there's Zone 7. That's Miami-Dade. These are supposed to be stupid restricted keys that no one should have. But if you can buy the lock, like the Louisiana lock, or maybe the Virginia lock, like we've stepped through these Medico keys, taken them all apart, measured them, and usually returned them because they're expensive. Not to mention that code documents are a great thing. Patent documents, like this is the FSK, we're pretty sure it's all one keyway, that it's one key blank. So that if you can get this restricted blank, or you can cut them on an easy entry, you can then make your own Medico keys. And if you didn't know what blank it was, that's a really nice dimensional drawing that the ceasefire catalog has in it. Thank you very much for that ceasefire catalog. <laughs> so we could just do this all day, the idea of statewide by code fire keys. They exist. This is a real freaking thing. And it's worth pointing out that, uh, that this is all kind of coming out, I think, personally. Uh, this is speculation. I might as well qualify that. Medico, I think, kind of leaned on some of these code committees, especially with NFPA. That's what's driving. Florida, Virginia, and Louisiana's adoption of that Medico standard for their state. Because it actually, they've adopted a standard that now says it has to be patent protected, it has to be factory restricted, the keys have to be serialized, and it has to be an application process that basically the state's fire marshal approves. With that being said, there's also an older form of companies leaning on a state somehow to get a standard passed. And that's why Rhode Island is a little bit weird. So there you see there's a key, it's labeled WD01. That key existed long before the state of Rhode Island ever adopted it. A company called Adams, which is now a division of Schindler Elevator, had used that key forever. Somehow, Rhode Island said, that's the key we want. Is there anything about that key that makes that desirable? No. No. It's just a plain old it's key. Like, it's like a Y13 key blank. Like, you know, like anybody can get, a, can get that. Anybody can copy it. It doesn't make any sense. Question. Uh, do people use 3D I have not heard of them doing that with elevators. <laughs> right. But the question is, do people use 3D printers? Yes. I mean, Skylar's not. People have 3D printed a lot of hard to get keys. This knowledge is still pretty restricted. Like, you, we're trying to at least blank some of this out for people watching at home, not making these keys on their own. But, I mean, it, once this knowledge gets out, and it probably will eventually, I'm sure people will be making these keys by any means they can. And we're not saying that, like, these are bad locks per se. We're not saying, like, Medico is all, we're not Mark Tobiasing you up here. We're not saying Medico is, like, the worst thing ever. You all need to go get, like, Fiché F3D keys and stuff. No, like, you can, the, the cylinder's a nice cylinder, but don't consider them ironclad, one-stop shop security. Don't consider that, like, your Knox box or your key box will always be secure. Like, <laughs> Yeah, people lose Knox box keys. And the only reason we, we didn't like, have to you know, rekey all the Knox boxes was this woman found it on the sidewalk. And she's like, this looks weird. Let me go. 
Thank goodness. Thank goodness, the woman. I'm sure she didn't copy it first. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, right? So yeah, these little key boxes and you know, how they're used, just because you see a key box somewhere and you're like, oh, look, they must put this key in that. They may not be to code. They may not be where they belong. They may just be on our hotel room or something like this. And the idea of, like, oh, no one could ever get that key, the, like, we, Howard rails against FEOK1. The fact that it was pushed, the way, it was rammed the down this industry. Exists. I mean, yeah. the fact that a tubular key was adopted for this purpose and is being still adopted for this purpose in jurisdictions that haven't adopted that level of code yet is absurd. And the, basically, if you take one other thing away from this talk besides don't do this yourself, is that this standard needs to die right now. And I've been, I've been very vocal about that in the elevator industry. And if you guys can take that back from your side, and let build, you know, you as building owners or representatives of building owners, push back and tell your code officials, I am not putting this in my building. And remember that guy who got in all that trouble in the New York Post and elsewhere because he was like selling the keys. And he was some retired locksmith fuck, right? This vendor, one of these two, I'm not going to say which vendor, one of these is an actual industry vendor of the of the, in, in the elevator world. And they are now just flagrantly selling these keys to anyone on eBay, but just through, you know, the fake, you know. There's like a sock puppet company. They're like, well, we don't want to use our name. That could get weird. But this, the same, what's old is new again, and this is still happening. So be aware of that. Also, one other note regarding the hoistway and security. Yes, it's dangerous. Remember, it's dangerous. Don't ever do what you're about to see here. Do you think inside the hoistway, those hoistway doors have any security or locks for the most part? No. 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 So if you are able to never do this, right, kids watching at home? If you are able to seize an elevator on a pen test or something, you'll see the surveillance of where we are right now, and up here is where we want to be. On that car top, there are controls to drive the elevator. They are the same you control the universe kind of controls. If you have those controls, and you want to get somewhere the elevator does not want to go, you will be able to get there, and once you are there, you will be able to get out without any kind of restriction. The exception being the lowest landing, because the car is always going to be in your way. And you've got to go through the little, little Spider-Man hole. Right. <laughs> right. So here we are. My mother hated this video when she was like, going doing up, what? Going up. her jaw is just dropping as she's watching me show this video. I'm like, look what I did today at work. So sure enough, there we are. We're just traveling the hoistway on the car top. Going up to the next floor, which was the restricted floor. Not platform level, obviously. We're platforming the car top at the edge of the floor. And then there's your release. No security, no catches, no clutches. Oh. Yeah, I mean, if someone was watching a security camera, maybe that would look weird. How many people watch security cameras in buildings nowadays? If you control that, or of course, if you get into a motor room. If you're in a motor room, you are effectively God. There are things you can do from a motor room, and Howard has this great analogy, right? Yeah, I mean, you guys all get different levels of like, access in IT, but the reason machine room access is particularly dangerous and particularly powerful is because since the controller is making all the decisions, bypassing or you know, creating circuits that shouldn't normally be created, gives you a level of control of the parameters of the universe, right? Like, oh yeah, that limit switch? That limit switch no longer exists. Right, so now you can over-travel, okay? You can, go, you, you can crash it on the buffer, you know, things like that. It's, yeah. you know, you're, you're changing the way the elevator perceives the world, and, it's, you know, and you can see how that can be a problem. And it's all done with simple little jumpers. Well, most of the time it's just yeah. jumpers, yeah. So, like, you know, one time we're on an inspection, and we find this, and we say, well, what's going on here? You guys got a jumper on the controller. And the guy's like, oh, no, it's cool, because, see, you know, it's just because the relay wasn't working right, so we were just, like, jumping out part of the relay. No, that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. Like, this is great, right? Looking for the graffiti inside where the, the elevator folk leave the notes to each other. That's all jumper notes for tests and doing things, jumping out various safeties in the system. Because during a test, this man, as he said, is going to remake the universe and do something like, for example, like this. What's happening here? This is a five-year test. So there's three different types of tests. Semi-annual, annual, five-year. There's other types of tests, too, but those are the three main ones. In a five-year test, you put the elevator on its full load, you run it at full speed, and then you... Crash it in the bucket. And everything's fine. 
There's the no elevator's there. supposed to do that. It's yeah. fine. It's supposed no, to survive that. There's no one in there, of course. Yeah. Full, full load with right. we think. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like when the president ever gets in an elevator, you know there is not just Secret Service in the elevator with him or her. There is someone in the machine room with a competent elevator tech for that building. And there could be a situation where, like, you know, the terrorists and ISIS, they're like reaching through the cab, like trying to, ah, la, 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 like trying to stab the president. And they're grabbing the, the hoistway. They can jump out all of those, like, move it now, move it now, move it now. They can jump out all those door safeties and just drive that elevator down, get him to the garage, get him out of the building. You can jump out everything. That was a very I, I thought it was just in case there was an entrapment, but yeah, that okay, too. Okay, that's fine. All right, maybe that happens. <laughs> But let's dispense with uh, a couple other things that people might not know, some other myths. Thank you, by the way, for the extra few minutes. We are, we're doing well. We, we, are you guys still enjoying this, by the way? Yeah. All right, very good. Thank you. Everybody tell your friends that if they ever pretend the door close button hack is a thing, you're allowed to kick them in the balls. Like, yeah. That's actually in elevator code if someone says that. It, everybody in the elevator industry will tell you, you have to hit alarm, call cancel, all of the floor buttons, and jam the door with your dick at the same time. That's the hack. Yeah, no. <laughs> No, let's talk about real elevator hacks for a minute in the industry. Okay, so right now we're looking at a relay logic controller, right? So you see that there's an armature that can move there and complete a circuit or not, right? Well, what if you move the armature? Right, with a pencil, let's just say. That was like <laughs> super popular back in the day, or if you still work on relay logic controllers. All of that decision making that that controller is capable of doing goes out the window if you're holding in the motor, you know, the, the actual hoist motor contactor, not, not just the re like a, a relay, the difference between a relay and a contactor, right? Like a contactor is like capable of handling a little more power, right? So you push in the contactor for the motor, push in the up or down contactor, guess what? That elevator's moving at contract speed even if its doors are open. Even if it's on its finals, right? Yeah, yeah. even if it's on its finals. There's you're a lot of steps car. you're supposed to take if the elevator's finaled out. But elevator guys will be like, guess what? Is it moving, Charlie? <laughs> Not on its finals? Yay, let's have a beer. Good, reset it. Like, <laughs> this is, oh, great. This is, you told me this is another 5 p.m. Yeah, on this, a Friday right. hack. So there's, a, there's an expression that we have. That there's the right way, the wrong way, and then the elevator guy way, which is the wrong way, but faster. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, this is a selector. It looks a little different than the one that you saw because it's a little more primitive. But instead of having like an actual magnetic strip and a reed sensor, it's basically just a steel vein. And then as those, as the, you know, as the sensor is actually approaching the steel vein, it's you know, it's either optical or magnetic. I honestly don't know what that particular system uses. But it's going to eventually be completely occluded by that vein. That's when it's level with the floor. The thing is, that vein should never move. So if you're on a job, that a, the elevator's you know not leveling right or something, and it's 4:30 on a Friday, and you say to yourself, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to move the vein. That vein has been there for 30 years. You think that's the solution suddenly? <laughs> no, it is then. Yeah. yeah. Right. This so is going to screw everything else yeah, up. Yeah, it's going to have crazy unintended consequences, but like, that's something that we've seen before, that a guy has moved a vein, and then they're like surprised that, oh, yeah, somebody tripped and fell because the elevator wasn't level at a different floor. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> what if your elevator keeps dropping like when it's supposed to be platform but not? because your hydro cylinder is leaking or something. Right. Well, hydraulic systems will leak a little bit anyway. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> this is an interesting one. This is the bottom of a roped hydro. There's a traction shiv up there. The ropes are going over that. And then you see the jack, and it'll lift up the traction shiv, and that'll move the ropes, right? So apparently, it was bottoming out. So they're like, you know what we'll do? We'll take some bolts. And we'll kind of jam them in there. And this way, you know, when it loses its pressure, it'll just sit on the bolts. Yeah. That's this good. is an industry of band-aids, man, in some buildings. <laughs> like, like, how do you work on this car? Inspection, no work. Stop switch only. <laughs> like, now, this is, not, again, you're not going to die, but this is how entrapments happen. This is how breakdowns happen, because the industry doesn't pay the right person to do the right job, and somebody just make, make it quick and fast. It's, is it running again? Cool. I'm out of here. This was a very famous case that Howard worked on. And it was, a, it was actually a really bad injury because an elevator was running With the without doors the doors closing all the way. And if you don't think, again, just to prove to you this is completely possible, this is video they shot for the testimony. Elevators are never supposed to do what you're about to see. So there, the doors are open. Whoop. Bye-bye. <laughs> And a, in the actual case, a woman was in the middle of the, the door when that happened. Let's and she, just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah like yeah. it's bad. Yeah. 
But I mean, that's all because they were in the motor room jumpering out certain contacts. Not, not they. No, you guys, yeah, yeah. they were recreating it for court. <laughs> that, guy, that guy's in Rikers right now. Right? Yes. Yeah, the elevator man was uh, very negligent. But that's the idea. If you're in the motor room, you absolutely can remake the universe. Now, we've been pretty gracious on time. We have, we had a whole section on like freaking and phones. We got to get a thumbs up or thumbs down on whether we can talk about it. Yeah. All right, uh, what, what say you guys? Is that all right? All right, all right. So if you're entrapped in an elevator, sometimes, yes, ma'am. So the wind was blowing so hard that there was a draft and the door couldn't close. So the elevator yeah. probably wouldn't travel at that point though, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, just, just grab and shove. No, don't, don't, ever, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you wind up entrapped when you slam the door interlock. So some elevators will not just like, register an alert upstairs and say, hey, somebody's pretty screwed. Most elevators should have a phone, right? You guys have seen these? Say a few words about phones. Yeah, well actually, uh, phones are sort of falling out of vogue. But now, like, the big thing is just pushing a button, and that button will trigger a phone call with a pre-recorded message. The idea being that for accessibility reasons, a person may be unable to communicate, either for language reasons, or, you know, they're unable to speak for, you know, whether it's duress or a physical issue. And, you know, or maybe you're having a heart attack, you can't breathe, you know, whatever. So you, the idea is that now you're supposed to just be able to push a button and just get help. But, uh, but traditionally, elevators had telephones. And those telephones were just connected to POTS lines that came all the way through the traveling cable, you know, through the motor room, through the traveling cable, and back into the cab. So sometimes on like large jobs, you know, you'll see things are tied into the PBX system. So, you know, maybe it's an extension somewhere, but a lot of times it's just a POTS line. So a lot of these phones weren't even compatible with a lot of like digital systems, right? Like it's just meant to have a POTS line and that's just it. And that's what you're gonna get. Could anybody in this room do something fun with an unprojected phone line they might just stumble across somewhere? <laughs> How many people have something like this in your pen test bag? <laughs> But also, this is something that hackers have done for a while, is if you can get the actual phone number for that line, like, I don't know, maybe it's written inside the panel. <laughs> or maybe it's on a plaque outside the, I don't know why you would need it on a plaque. But calling the phone, it will usually do what? Connect you directly to the phone. So Silently. If you're into war dialing, and those silent numbers you get every once in a while, think twice about them, maybe sit on them for a little bit and see if you start hearing things. You could call an elevator and start talking to the occupants and, I don't know, make them think they're crazy. <laughs> Be like, I'm watching you go up and down. <laughs> I, I, prefer, I prefer going, help, they've turned me into an elevator. <laughs> but the bigger issue as far as security is concerned is not calling and talking, but calling and just listening. There have been actual instances of high value targets. Knowing, people know where they're staying in town, if there's a big meeting of you know, State Department folk. People calling the elevator lines and just listening to talk, because how many people have like private conversations in an elevator? It's this little enclosed space just for you and whomever's in there. And that's a really big security risk. If you're already just up in the motor room, there's just an intercom in the motor room. You can listen to what's going on because it's not like there's ringing in the cab whenever anybody is actually, whoops, actually in there just, you know, talking. So there's a few more notes we can give you. We want to send you home if you have any control over your buildings and such. We want to send you home with some advice to watch out for a few things. So, entrapments are the biggest problem, right? Entrapments are pretty common. You really shouldn't have a whole heck of a lot of unexpected shutdowns or entrapments in a building. Um, the sort of rule of thumb is that in like a typical office building, a car might unexpectedly shut down a couple times a year. It might entrap somebody in a year. If you're having repeated entrapments and you're like, didn't that just happen? You probably need to look into it a little further. Not having the phone work. Phones not working is a huge thing that, you know, one of the most easy violations to write, frankly, is just, oh, the phone didn't work, great, write that one up. <laughs> so, but uh, this was an unusual one. It's an apparently not an uh, intercom, it's just a speaker. So you just have to shout and hope someone hears you somewhere in the building. <laughs> like, yeah, have a proper damn phone in your elevator. Have the alarm bell work. Yeah, the alarm bell is also supposed to go off when the stop switch is put, uh, pulled or pushed. Um, that rule has changed over the years, the code did require an alarm, then it didn't require an alarm, and then you had to have a keyed stop switch, and then they went back on that. And so basically, regardless of what code you're supposed to be on, make sure your alarm button's working, because the alarm button should always work. Yeah. Make sure that people can't just stumble accidentally somewhere in the building into the hoistway. Hoistway should never be, it's not like in the movies where you can just get in and out of the hoistway and sneak around the building. The hoistway doesn't have pushbacks, it doesn't connect to the vents, it's not supposed to connect to anything 
You're not supposed to be able to just look in the hoistway and like climb in there and start riding around on the counterweight like a fucking jackass. Like, I... look at that motherfucker. Don't do that. <laughs> like, and we're talking about this. Like, hoistways are supposed to be fire rated. I, like, I look at that picture that he that he has there, and I'm like, how does this even happen? Like, who will prove this? Yeah. Motor room doors. They're supposed to be self-closing, self-locking, right? Right. Just so like, that totally works. Just like this one. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's compliant. You're only supposed to have an authorized Ele person. Only elevator personnel, which means people who have actually been trained in the construction, maintenance, repair, testing, and inspection of elevators. Like that guy. No. <laughs> yeah. Motor rooms are dangerous. Proper techs are the ones supposed to be in there. If you're failing your maintenance control procedures, if people are coming to inspect your MCP, and there's actually nothing fucking on it. Like, from an accident site. Yeah. You, this guys, you guys knew we were coming, right? Like, you didn't even fake it. You just left the blanks there. Yeah. If you're a building owner and you're worried that these jobs aren't being serviced correctly, it's like having a doctor. Get a second opinion. Call someone else. Call him. Call anybody else you trust, and they will find things that someone else might not be doing. Or they'll find stupid maintenance hacks, like this one, right? Yeah, this is a good one. So, OK. Three-phase power, right? A little different than like your typical residential setup, okay? Three-phase power is great for large motors. Makes it a little bit more efficient, right? So the problem is though, if one of those phases blows a fuse, trips a circuit, all of them need to trip. Otherwise, you end up with something called single phasing, right? Or, you know, basically the motor's gonna burn itself out if it's not getting the power that it's expecting from the supply, okay? So this elevator has a mainline disconnect switch that has fuses inside of it, and this is what we found. Those, those are, are not fuses. <laughs> those are not fuses. It's just, it's just bar stock that's just connected across it. And when we found out what was going on, they were like, well, you know, the motor uh, kept blowing uh, fuses, one, you know, yes. kept blowing the A phase, and so. Uh, yeah, we figured this like, would solve it. So, so what? <laughs> or this is a cute trick. Yeah. If you think they won't notice, elevator yeah. inspectors should notice this. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, you know, I've been in the field. This is the kind of stuff you find. There's just a wire wrapped around the fuse, right? So if you look at it from a distance, you go, yeah, it looks good. You look closely and there's a tiny strand there and it's going to help bypass some of the current around that fuse. Here's a relay logic system. You think it's healthy right now? That's all carbon dust. That is, yeah, and it's conductive. So <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, there's just relays of it burning all the time, scattering conductive dust everywhere. What could possibly break in that? That's before and after on the same thing. Yeah, yeah if that wasn't obvious. Oh, this was great that you found these bags of like Yeah, it's drive. like, oh, hey, who's storing all the kitty? Who's got a cat in the motor room, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a hydraulic elevator. And yeah, and they have leaks. So we walk in, we find all this shit on the floor, and we find a drip pan under the valve body <laughs> that's, that's so overflowing that the tag is submerged. Like, the oil pads are saturated, the rag, it's just like squirting hydro oil everywhere. So why does this kind of stuff happen? There's conflicts of interest sometimes. There's people who are like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. No, we're totally doing the job you've paid us for. Like, this test on the Otis elevator was performed by... Otis. <laughs> Who else? <laughs> like, it's supposed to be the tech's name, right? Yes. But no. You found a system once where they had been billed for new cabling and all kind of re-roping mm -hmm. constantly. This was a two-to-one car, and so the thing is, at the end of the rope, the end of the rope isn't like, any, you know, in a typical situation where it's on the top of the car, on top of the counterweight. There was a dead end in what's called a secondary room. And that secondary room involves like somebody my size crawling in and being very uncomfortably claustrophobic in there. So I, I crawled in and I found that test tag. Oh, not test tag, that's, that's, that's the install tag. tag. Yeah. It says 72, right? It says yeah. 72. These yeah. ropes had never been changed. And, and they this were, was and they tens were of thousands of dollars times. every time. It was a huge lawsuit. So again, if you are getting red tagged, if your shit is faulting out, there's a reason for it. There's something went wrong, and you, somebody somewhere wasn't listening to someone. And it, the people in the industry who know, they, they're leery of this stuff. And they'll tell you if you really want to, like, I love the next footage. There was a, this was a, a final acceptance test, right? Correct. And one of the guys was like, this is this not, not going to work. work. <laughs> and they're like, shut up, it's fine. So the, the guy with the his phone. Yeah, the manager on the job, you know, again, there's a separation of, of uh, you know, management and labor, especially in the elevator industry, a lot of unionization. So the, the management was like, no, trust me, this is fine, run the test. And the guy on the field was like, I tell you what, I'm going to stand here with my camera. You run it. Yeah. This happened. <laughs> Governor Tripp. And it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So that job is fucked. You know, everything, all the work you just did, it's out the window. You have to completely redo that entire installation. I mean, well, the rails are good, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. So in the end, follow the right procedures. If people are coming in saying they're the elevator folk, like we do this on tests, all the real tests, he does it. I do it just as like a pen test. I'm just like, yeah, I'm here to get in the elevator. You, I'm a local official. I'm not doing an elevator acceptance. I'm just breaking in. But if your security guard is an elevator, fire that security guard. It should not be the elevator. The final story we're going to give you is one that Howard encountered, right? Yep. So I, I was in an elevator on a job. I saw this. I'm like, wow, that is sick. That's thumbprint, contactless smart card, pin. And yeah. it's got FEOK1. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just so you're, we're clear, right, it's on fire service right now, right? Guess where this was? Is that an airport? This is an airport. And it connected an insecure area to, to a the sterile area. area. Yeah. So the idea of flipping to fire service mode and going up to the sterile zone, you know, you could do that as a security evaluator, or you could do that as an actual bad actor. And how are you going to actually know who's doing what in this elevator if there's no human? It's not a security guard. It's not even a blue shirt, pretend cop TSA. It's just an elevator being trusted to not run people up without the credential. But if the credential is a $13 key on eBay, that's a problem. And people ask him later in the bar. There have been a whole, there was a huge bank job. There was a diamond heist job in Antwerp that involved leveraging the elevators. Sure did. Ask him about crazy elevator stories that we didn't have time for here. So in the end, what does this mean for you? It means two things. It means if you are worried about security, there are regular parts oil and grease techs, and then there are proper elevator security consultants. That is not your average elevator tech. That is someone who is way cooler and way better at a poker table. <laughs> if, you, if you are ever trapped, if you're not a building owner, but you just want to make sure things go right, if you are stuck, follow the following steps, and you'll probably be fine. You can write them down, think them over, watch the video later. First don't of all, don't panic. panic. You're you not are going to run, out of, gonna run out of air. All the, oh, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. No, you're fine. I know you don't. might be claustrophobic. The elevator's fine. Don't panic. And also, don't press emergency call just yet. What can they try? Well, when you press emergency call a lot of times, there's going to be a procedure, you know, like a script, like any call center is going to follow, and they're going to try to talk you through it, because they want to make sure that you're not actually just sitting there and then, you know, not actually entrapped. So the first thing is, you know, they might ask you, hey, are the lights on, or is the emergency light on? But if the lights are off, I mean, you know, it's pretty obvious what's happening, right? A power outage is going to shut down most elevators unless it's equipped with an emergency generator or certain hydraulics can kind of lower themselves. That's a whole other thing. But if the lights are on, you're either entrapped or something is just sort of kind of soft wrong. You can troubleshoot. Try pressing door open. Even if, sometimes you can be at a restricted floor and parked. Press door open and the door will still open. Many times. Try that first. A lot of people don't. Well, you know, and that's, another, I mean, that's another hack you can try you know, without getting yourself killed. Get in the elevator. Don't hit a call. See if it moves you up. Sometimes it'll park itself up because it's on down peak. You step in. The elevator says, I have no demand. Well, I'll go back to my home floor upstairs because I'm expecting people to come down. You're inside. It goes up. You hit door open when you get to the floor. Now you're on a floor you should have been badged in for. It happens. OK? Try pressing door close, then pressing door open. Sometimes the door just didn't fully close properly. The elevator's not going to leave the floor unless the inside door and the outside door are fully closed and locked. So that's a way to cycle it. Try placing calls, including to the lobby, unrestricted floors. Just, just hit every damn button. You know, we're not going to mind when we reset it. And then, you know, if it's got a badge system like here, try to badge in. Try to place floor claws again. Hit every button again. See, you know, see if it's going to do something. Uh, a lot of times, if you got this far, this isn't even going to work. But if you got keys, try the keys at that point. Yeah, we've, you know, you got the keys. You need them. Yeah, they'll help. And then, of course, you know, again, speaking to the fact that cab doors need to be closed in order for an elevator to run. Most doors are flat. Well, you know, sometimes you'll see like a, a circular cab with like rounded doors. But most doors are flat, so that's what I'm going to be speaking to. Kind of put your flat of your palm on, grab like, on the middle of the door, not near the, not near the gap, you know, not near the edge, you know, depending on what kind of door it is. And just see if it's moving around a little bit. You know, a lot of times if you actually slide it closed, maybe it was just 95% closed. It was closed but not locked. You know, it just didn't drop in. The switch didn't pick up. That's another way. Sometimes that'll actually get you going again. It means something's wrong, though, so still report that. Yeah. And then, you know, if you're still fucked, you know, hit the button, and then you know, yeah. out. When you're trying to get out, things never to do. Don't go through that stupid top hatch like in the movies. Usually, it can be locked from the outside, or it'll screw other things up. It'll trip another sensor that says, nope, that circuit's broken. Now I can't move if the elevator's trying to move. Right, there are contacts yeah. on And then the if you get on the top hatch, what are you effing going to do? 
There's no ladders in the hoistway like in Hollywood. You're, now you're just in filthy and in the dark. And then you don't know what you're doing now. Anyway, don't go through the top hatch. Don't ever exit a badly misleveled car. The rule of thumb is if you have to jump, that is too far. Don't fucking do it. That's how people get pinched. Don't listen to like the building owner's maintenance guy when he's like, no, no, I got this. I found this filthy bitch. Come on, let's just go ahead and get out of there. I'll help you out. <coughs> Wait for proper first responders. Tell that person, oh, yeah, you know, the manager said it's okay. I say, fuck a bunch of you. Get the fire department or the or elevator, elevator staff out here. If you're in the car, that's the safest place to be. You are going to be fine. You're not going to die. You're going to have some stories to tell later. You're going to live, and you're going to tell us about it, and then we'll all laugh about it on Twitter. So thank you so much. Thank you for the extra time. We love you guys. Thanks for having us here.